Good morning, everybody. Uh, here is the second part of the counterplan lecture. Last time we talked about what a counterplan is, why the negative team should read a counterplan. We talked about the status of the counterplan, how counterplans compete, how to make sure we write a good counterplan text, all of those other different elements. So today, we're going to talk about what to do when you're affirmative if somebody reads a counterplan. The acronym to remember is SPOT, right? Whenever you see a counterplan, run, SPOT, run. It's a good acronym that gives you not just the arguments you need to remember to read, but it gives you them in terms of the order of the most to the least important things you can do against a counterplan. So the first step, or the S in spot, is solvency deficit, which is essentially coming up with an argument as to why the affirmative solves the harms or the advantages of the affirmative case in specific reasons why the counterplan may not solve. So a good example against the state's counterplan would be with the death penalty affirmative, right? So when people are like the 50 states and relevant territories should abolish the death penalty, you can point out from the solvency evidence in your 1AC that says, here are the states that have, you know, wanted to go their own road on death penalty decisions. There's the, the card that cites Texas, how they'll find their own way to keep doing the death penalty in the world where they can create their own regulations. So you can find stuff that says, like, here's why we need federal action, right? You need something that comes from your affirmative case that explains why the counterplan doesn't solve it. Second is where you start comparing the case and its advantage or the affirmative and its harms to the world of the counterplan and the net benefit. Remember, the net benefit is the disadvantage that the counterplan avoids or a specific advantage to the counterplan. This is where you need to be able to explain why not solving the case outweighs the impact of the net benefit. This puts the affirmative back in the forefront because if the affirmative wins that they create a necessary and meaningful change to the status quo, then that's a reason why you ought to vote affirmative. And if the impacts of the affirmative outweigh the impacts of the net benefit, then it's most definitely a reason why the judge should end up voting affirmative when it's the plan versus the counterplan. Step two, or the P in spot, is the permutation. The permutation is a test of competition where you see if there's a way that you can combine all of the affirmative with all or part of the action of the counterplan to see if you can create a policy that solves the best of both worlds. So permutation is something as simple as like perm do both, perm do the counter plan, perm do the plan, then the counter plan, perm do X, you know, X and Y. So it's a combination of the world of the affirmative and the world of the counter plan. In terms of, I thought, no. Nope. Step three is your offense. Do you have disadvantages to the counterplan? Do you have case turns? Do you have impact turns to the counterplan? What are reasons as to why the counterplan, you know, the counterplan not solving, the solvency deficit argument is defensive. So are is there an offensive reason why the counterplan is bad, right? So you could read things that say like against the state's counterplan that federalism leads to policies that fail to balance like issues of racial equality in the criminal justice system 
uh, or it creates, allows for the creation of policies that are more racist or more racially inequitable, that would be offense to the counterplan. Not just a reason why the counterplan is weak game and doesn't solve, but is there a reason why the counterplan is objectively bad? Step four is theory. These are reasons why the counterplan is bad for debate. So when we talked about status in the, the previous lecture, right, why is conditionality bad? Why is dispositionality bad? Uh, should counterplans be topical? Should counterplans be not topical? Do they need to have a solvency advocate? Here's where you can come up with any, any kinds of objections as to why either the negative team should lose for reading a counterplan that is problematic, or why the judge should not evaluate the counterplan for some theoretical objection. So in terms of thinking through some of these a little bit more, we'll talk about permutations and theory in a little bit more depth because we've talked about solvency and solvency deficits before, and then we've talked about offense before. So permutations have to include the entirety of the plan, and then it should include all or part of the counterplan. The goal of this is to test the competition of the counterplan, right? We said that counterplans traditionally compete in one of two ways, either net benefits or mutual exclusivity. So in a world where, you know, perm do both and you prove that the plan and the counterplan can coexist, it means that they're not mutually exclusive. Or if perm do both does not, you know, cause a link to the net benefit, then it is a reason why the counterplan does not compete in the world of net benefits. So it's not a reason why you should reject the affirmative. So there are inclusive perms, right? Perm do both tends to be interpreted as do the entirety of the plan and the entirety of the counterplan. Sometimes people will make time frame permutations, right? Do the counterplan, then the plan, or do the plan, then the counterplan. Sometimes people say these are problematic because if you said do the counterplan first, then you are not doing the entirety of the plan because you're not doing the plan immediately. So that's a potential area for argument. Uh, perm do the counterplan will work uh, only for certain types of plan inclusive counterplans, and we'll talk more about that uh, in a different lecture. I don't want to talk about intrinsic perms, and I can't edit it out in here. So an intrinsicness permutation is something that tends to be demonstrably bad, uh, but it's doing all or part, all of the plan, all or part of the counter plan, and then something else outside. So we'll talk more about that later uh, in terms of how to answer intrinsicness permutations if you are negative, but I think these are bad when you're In terms of theory, uh, you can do things to say, like, you know, read theory arguments based on the status of the counterplan, so conditionality is bad, dispositionality is bad. You can say plan inclusive counterplans are bad, plan exclusive counterplans are bad, agent counterplans are bad, process counterplans are bad, topical counterplans are bad, right? The negative team doesn't get the right to fiat, that you don't get multiple actor fiat, which is something that you can read against the state's counterplans. These are all reasons that the AF can, uh, or all objections that the affirmative team can raise to go, we think this counterplan is problematic uh, and it's, it's not good for debate. And if you frame the argument like that, right, it becomes a reason as to why the judge shouldn't evaluate the counterplan or theory arguments can become more offensive and be they should lose because they did X and they become uh, voting issues, right? And theory debates are 
hard to get into sometimes. So one of the things that I'll have attached to an assignment on classroom is like a conditionality good, conditionality bad theory block. And we'll kind of work through in class what these arguments look like when they are read against each other. But you tend to not see a lot of good in-depth theory debates until you get into some of the varsity or DCI level. That theory debates in novice and open tend to be a little bit more messy uh, because people just stand up and read their pre-written blocks at one another. And it's hard to you know, go back and look at things. So I'm going to scroll through here and see if there's anything else that I want from there. No, I think we're good. So if you've got questions, uh, shoot me an email, pop back into the Zoom and let me know. Uh, send me a message on Classroom, any of those things. But that's everything that you need to know for now about the, the world of counterplans from the affirmative and from the negative. So if you've got any questions, drop me a line.